Okay. Let's do this. <sighs> Hello, everyone. <clears throat> it's 3 a.m. and uh, I couldn't sleep, so I decided to speak about an interesting idea. The title of tonight's episode is to be honest, an incredible one where I have attempted in many of my uh, talks to talk about this idea, but I always seem to be approaching it. It's as if I can never draw the whole picture. The whole picture of this idea requires 8 billion beings and their involvement with life. The title of tonight's episode is The Hidden Commands of Collective Evolution. I want to speak about life's responsibility to itself in some degree and when we kind of let me explain something to you life for the human being primarily i think my voice isn't loud enough jesus hello hello okay okay it's loud Here it is. What could hidden commands of a collective evolution be? Dear listener, I'm going to assume you can hear my voice. Hopefully you can hear me properly. So it begins. You see, there's a concept I've developed. I called it, I call it the winds of evolution. For me, divinity is not conceptual. It's uh, beyond the language threshold. Anything divine points to the unknown moving knowledge rather than knowledge moving the unknown. For me, I find in, in this modern era of ours, we fail to capture the true value of life. I find that um, there was a war before um, language developed in the mind of people. That war was not in a war we can understand. It was a war between, uh, it, on a cellular, a cellular level. It was how this whole planet was constantly being beamed by, like light was hitting it um, as it's orbiting around the sun. It's as if there is a unique clockwork to the cosmos. Anyways, this idea of, of the hidden commands of evolution, it arises from the winds of evolution. It arises from, in some sense, the unconscious moving the conscious. And it is fair to say that in a human life, if you live long enough, you will have moments where you don't know what's going on. Those moments tend to be moments where we either get ideologically possessed any mo any time in your life you don't want to know more that is when you have been ideologically possessed and i'm saying this playfully what i mean by ideological possession is kind of like you can say tony stark was possessed by his iron man suit when he was in it when he was outside of it he wasn't in that ideological navigation of that certain uh, technology i consider language personally as a technology of course the reason I consider it as a technology is because I, I have lived enough years identifying with it. Now, I, I find myself to be the uncommon man. Because the common man, to be honest, and what is really reasonable for um, the masculine kind of energetic expression, let, and let me say it like this, the archetype of a man has to be the, that, the type of human being that in some sense 
uh, it's it, uh, how can I say it? It's like prior to gender, prior to anything, there is an evolutionary design, and then that evolutionary design has certain intentions of its own. But beyond that evolutionary design is the subjective personal life of the person. The subjective personal life of the person is a room that they are in. So let me tell you what's cool about your imagination. Your imagination is literally like your biological being being a sort of antenna. Okay, it's a, it's a room you're in that nobody else sees but you. That's the imagination. That's why we call it imagination. Now, when what we see in that room it validates into actual reality, we, we no longer can call the thing as an, uh, in some sense, imagination. It's as if the phenomena from the unknown shores, uh, from the unknown oceans of our imagination has come to the shore, has, has come to the shore of known uh, known. Uh, of conscious knowledge to be honest it's a knowing game the what the strongest person is always the person who knows more but what is knowing in, in in this era that is the question Collective evolution is a concept that mustn't be shared with people who still feel self is more valuable than others. You see, it is true. Any person who goes to the spiritual kind of atmosphere of ideological existence, literally what that means is you're living in a moment where the relationship between your imagination, pretty much your imagination and reality, the, uh, what's, uh, the, the medium between has become more transparent. So uh, all those people inspired towards true metaphysical experience, not just language, uh, because the word spirit, what does it mean? It's a word. It's a noun. You're hearing me say a noun. What does this noun tr truly mean? It is the implication of how much your conscious uh, exist, uh, your conscious experience has dared to um, explore your unconscious existence. That's the best way of saying it because the, if it's like it's like what's the point of there being greater dimensions if we access them we would still not know. It's as if there needs to be the first reference point, and this has to be solidified. What that means is, um, By the way, um, since the nature of this talk is a live stream, anybody listening who feels wants to share or contribute an idea to the talk, um, just type it in the chat section and I'll include it. I'll bring it into kind of the karma of the talk. You see, the commands of collective evolution are the suggestions are the hidden commands of collective evolution. They're the suggestions of uh, getting to know how the unknown moves knowledge. Now, something very surprising. Before you are who you are now, there had to be a moment where you were nobody. It's like you can't really get an appreciation for fullness un until you get an awareness of emptiness. This is why Buddhism, in some sense, has a strange modern value in the sense that it makes you aware uh, of the temporary, but through a neutral grace. You see, a lot of existence is an intense thing. Existence is uh, elemental 
uh, acceleration towards subjective being. Literally, Mr. Within is saying that we, the human species, it took us four billion years to be able to even consider ourselves having egos. Okay? So it's as if it's a long development. You can't just throw it away. You can't throw what is here away, but it doesn't mean what is here is the only thing that should be looked at. And so there has to come a balance, balance of sight. To be honest, the greatest teaching is you have to get to know the, your own rhythm of your sight. Your intelligence is not just something that functions in just moments of static image regurgitation. I am telling you, it's like educational systems, they don't know what they're doing. I think the educational system is scared. Because deep down, every, everything is held by emptiness. It's as if, to be honest, I am not surprised. Friedrich Nietzsche, this uh, German philosopher, he said one of the most, of course, he's a man of many great statements. I can't tell you this man's style of language was from another world. Literally, how his mind projected imagery was very unique. And so, Friedrich Nietzsche, most people just see the life of his body. Not a lot of people see the life of his mind. He pretty much said an incredible statement, and he said, God is dead, and we killed him. This sentence is so profound that if you said it to a college crowd in Western society, they would be like, fuck yeah. <laughs> but if you said it to the ear of every child in some unfortunate circumstance that is like, why is the universe? It's as if like the denial of their hope is, is, is a cause for their hatred. I noticed something incredible. As long as we blame, as long as this cause and effect mentality uh, survives of, okay, that thing caused this and that, that this person caused that, it will be an endless pointing game of imagination. This is the issue that, to be honest, the talk that I am giving, these words that arise based on my personal experience, you see the way I kind of divided it was it's like I realized educational system hadn't done this. Nobody in history, in some sense, cared to do it this way. They, they all tried to use the language that was there to share uh, ideas uniquely so poetry occurred, but nobody started with the evolution of the language, which meant it had to do with the evolution and the stretching of the conceptual existence. And the conceptual existence is how your moment has an objective component, like literally, literally like right now. If me and you were two honest human beings and you were somehow like I'm sitting on my porch, if you were here right now, and if I asked you, if I honestly asked you, Mr. Within asked you and was like, hey man, in this current moment, isn't it true that there is an objective component to the moment of being? We're all moments of being, right? Before we do anything and have free will in accordance to dynamic definition, it's as if like we are just stillness. We're just pure being. This is why anytime you stop doing something, you, you go into a state where it's as if consciousness is merging into an ocean. Anytime you do something, consciousness becomes a particle. It's very strange. I don't know how to how to truly explain it, but it's kind of like if you realize that there, your mind is right now here, that's why you are here. You suddenly realize this this room that you're only in your imagination has a unique value. It is the extra data you have access to alongside of what is given reality. You see, this is why I kind of, uh, at some point, I challenge just in my own playful, personal, philosophical writings, I, I in some sense, uh, challenged the notion of insanity. And I was like, and it was a very deep challenge because you see the first, like a lot of these ideas I share with you, trust me, I have, I am my own, uh, I am my worst critic. I could tell you this. I literally can 
say something, write something down, and sit down and totally dismantle that sentence. It's because I've, I've learned to distinguish between what is thought and what is me as a living being. Because there is life here. And when the stories, uh, 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 in some sense, this is the tragedy of the modern world, our desires and fears have denied us the ultimate rationality that efficiency is the purpose of life. That is it. It doesn't matter what you do, but if it is efficient and realistically contributes to the collective, do it. There is only one lifetime. To truly be alive, we don't understand this. This is why it's so easy to give in to ideological possession. Ideological possession, um, here, let me find better words. Let's not bring past imagery to this. Let me say it like this. Right now, my mind, literally this moment that I'm conscious, I see the objective phenomena and I notice that I'm seeing it. When you notice that you are, note you are aware you are seeing, that is where there has been enough of a stable point for the true center of the circle, the true gravitational pull of your mind to be discovered. What that means is it's as if just like how we say every the gravitational pull experience, like when you're walking on the street, we say that gravitational pull is of the center of the earth, right? The center of the earth is pulling it. Of course, we have no explanation why the center of the earth should be pulling it. Of course, we speak about the mass of the planet being so large that ultimately through, uh, through spherical uh, attention, it is like the center is the ultimate. You know, it's like the center of the sun is the secret of the sun. And so, to be honest, the human being is in the business of uh, light translation. Literally, you're translating light into subjective phenomena, and you are doing it, and you have to be humble enough to learn from the world. This is any child, any, any, any living being, who has come to a state where they realize, okay, this world is not just out of no, like it, it is out of nowhere kind of here, but it is, as, it is as ambiguous as our explorations attempt. Eventually there is like, how would I tell you? I've had emotions. I've literally written sentences about, like about the future, but with emotions of the past. And I've literally written sentences about the past with the emotions of the future. Eventually, when you notice this, you're kind of coming to the presence of your mind. I like to say it like this, because the presence of your mind shifts you from the intellectual search for action into the realization of the gradual development of the mind in accordance to rhythms of access of awareness. Life is honestly a gamble. Any decision of the free will has an opportunity cost. So we can say it is very true that the more intellectual the society becomes, the more depressed it will be if it wants something from the future. If right now you could exist in this current moment without wanting anything from your moment, this doesn't mean stopping what you're doing. It just is respect your ego to continue it, like continue being who you are, but uh, Mr. Within is just saying, have certain moments where you just watch life as you become a watcher of life. You, you start observing as if like, okay, the whole point of the waking state is to see how far the gas pedal can be maximized before you sleep. Now this maximization, of course, anything that promises us the unknown, this is the kind of chaotic philosophical position that I find human beings of course in 2019 they find themselves in 
we find ourselves in a world where we have lived in an illusion for so long that rather than questioning the illusion, we have accepted, we have denied the, any sort of truth beyond the illusion. So the first issue of a civilization is that the intellect is only powerful in its kingdom. When it's like when it leaves its kingdom, it is not powerful. That means literally if I took you, who you were, imagine you were the smartest person alive and somehow just playfully in this thought experiment I'm bringing up right now, like imagine we, we took you into a totally different civilization on a totally different planet similar to Earth. You would see it doesn't matter how much smarter you were in, the, in your past world, in the old world. You see, you have to adopt and adapt to the new world. And this is the revelation of the true honor of childhood. The child dies. The inner child dies. It's tragic. You know how it dies? It dies when it realizes the mind has to either adjust this speed to its current moment or it will suffer what it can't get. This is the truth. A lot of stress is because people, they're not dumb. Human beings are so incredibly alive, smart, that it's like, trust me, there's no stupid person alive. All of the stupid people have died. When I say stupid people died, what I mean by that is that one of the hidden commands of this cosmos is time. It's a command only conceptual in man's mind. That means it's as if like I've had certain dialogues with the void. And what I mean by that is that I have, I have attained certain observances of my own self from a state where my self is not limited to my thought, but is limited to the direct experiential attention of the moment. It's as if my energy levels are defining my truth prior to the thoughts I have or what the thoughts my energy levels lead to. So you have to realize the limitations of the tool, kind of like there are two different people who pick up a weapon. This is the difference between the master and this is the difference between the fool. There's only two. Uh, in everything you do in this life, you're either the master of the moment or you're the fool of the moment. If you are the fool of the moment, uh, the best thing you can do is laugh. You have to laugh and quickly move on. That's it. For me, anytime I fail, it's as if I look at life and I'm like, life, you playing games again? <laughs> Your mind is an evolutionary opportunity. I personally, Mr. Within, finds that I don't believe we are creatures that can be limited to language. I feel we evolutionary, like literally we're experiencing many moments. The best thing to say what we are as creatures are we are moments of attributeless attention, moments of witnessing. We're literally the eyes of the cosmos open through a certain form and through the appreciation of one's own form you eventually at some point however way the the spirit of the cosmos opens your eyes it, it, it's as if you suddenly realize the the elegance of the it's like the, the it's like the truth of the subjective uh, simulation 
is objective reality and the truth of the objective simulation is subjective reality when you realize this loop it's as if the guy goes back into heaven and he realizes there's nothing else to do in heaven and he suddenly the guy just in some sense it's a it's heaven is also a non-existence it means there is no more evolution it's as if it's as if the machine has no no, no more programs left to simulate so the old the old show is repeating you know There is this quote from Rumi. He says, I died as he's speaking about the evolution of his attention as a creature, as a phenomena, living phenomena. He's speaking about the evolution of life. He says, I died as a mineral and I became a plant. I died as a plant and I rose to animal. I died as an animal and I was man. Why should I fear death? When was I less by dying? I shall die once more to soar with angels blessed. But even from angelhood I must pass on to that which no mind has ever conceived. In that quote, the poet Rumi is attempting to keep the eternal unknown alive as an archetype. Pretty much this dude is saying it's like, I, I've, I've been known to say kind of like the purpose of matter, evolution of matter was to become a thought. 
but the purpose of evolution of a thought to, was to realize it was never matter. But then the purpose of the evolution of that which has realized it was never matter is a reversion. It is a return. It is something where literally voices will no longer matter because your moment is not individual. It's as if it has never, it never was. It's as if you awaken in a paradise that only your mind knew. You know? For me, my mind is, uh, I must protect it. But at the same time, I must direct it, you know? Intelligence is an opportunity. To be honest, realistically, common sense, if me and you were in the most secular coffee shop in the world talking, like, I would say, um, really, we have no purpose. Aside from seeing what the greatest possibility would be, which means an attempt towards efficient vision as the peak of the evolution of the civilization. These two words, efficient vision, is um, it is a sky where the pilots of consciousness of the future generations will navigate through. The pilots of consciousness are certain people. There are these certain, uh, how can I tell you, they, they are human beings who open up to the multidimensional nature of reality early on. And regardless of if they put it away or not, their mind has considered the, the abstraction and visualization has open stretched their imagination. That means if you were a writer, you had a dream, and in that dream you saw some next level things, and then you woke up, you can, you're, it's like when you write, you're going to use that inspiration that was attained from that state of consciousness. To be honest, really, there you can't really talk about a changing world too much because what are you talking about? It's changing all the time. So there is that challenge. However, it's like uh, there's, there's a sort of elegance. It's as if as much as we see the unknown, it's like you can never be t too paralyzed by the unknown because the unknown, eventually, the concept of God only exists for man. It's as if, why didn't any of the prophets go to like the pigs and cows and, and just try to convert them? Why did, why, did, why did no prophet go to other animals? You see? They didn't go to any other species. They didn't go to enlighten birds and bring them towards a certain religion. And I am not being disrespectful in, in any way, but I am suggesting the... Uh, the, in, in, the in, interesting point in theological in a theological kind of study of an approach it's it's like how would I tell you it's um, the prophet spoke to minds that could hear the message what that meant is that people were just lost in their own worlds Suddenly some dude comes and says there's something more and everybody's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And suddenly it's as if a sort of subconscious renaissance occurs, a sort of triggering of, uh, of how like one person's behavior affects everybody, you know. And so what this really means is that the species is, it, it will become more familiar. We think that we have to be different to be valuable. That is the sort of flaw of the um, stories of the world fed to children, spoon fed to children, you know? To be honest, it's like Diogenes, these, this ancient Greek philosopher, he said, uh, they asked him, hey, Diogenes, where are you from? And of course, Diogenes is known as the father of cynicism and philosophy. And um, he says, me, I am a citizen of the cosmopolites, as if like, how dare you ask? Me and you are, are, are authorizations of moments of being in, 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 a, in a universe of uh, uh, incredible unknown architecture.
Sorry about that, guys. Had to take care of something. <sighs> There's this sage that says, uh, his name's Shi Ramana Marshi. <clears throat> he says, silence uh, is also a conversation. And when I say he was a sage, to tell you uh, the level of insight that Sri Ramana Maharshi had. There's this story. Where Ramana Maharshi, this holy man who was always surrounded by disciples, decides to walk alone on a sunny day from one town to another. As he does, he comes to a tree that has no leaves and he just sits behind it. He puts his back on behind that tree and he just sits in some kind of like Buddha-like position and he just kind of like sleeps for a little bit. He says he suddenly wakes up and he's woken up and he notices that the tree above him suddenly has flowers on it and then he notices there's five, like a bunch of individuals standing in front of him. These individuals suddenly it's as if their voices are not their own. Uh, uh, they say that we are the seven gods of the seven heavens of the seven lokas in uh, Vedic me uh, metaphysics. And so the Sri Ramana Maharshi has this conversation and the gods could say to Ramana Maharshi, we are astonished. And it's as if the gods had come through various people, but through them, you know. The gods tell Sri Ramana Maharshi, you are such a quiet and silent being. And your mind is so, in some sense, still and observant purely that it's as if it's like uh, his, the, the observance of Sri Ramana Maharshi was fascinating for the gods in that moment. And of course, Sri Ramana Maharshi returns and he kind of like, the story's passed down. I heard it from Papaji uh, on YouTube. Eventually, I find 
that regardless of how the story of your life appears into manifestation, how your waking day occurs, there is a unique energy to every moment. You have to kind of realize, you have to embrace the world. All your fears will dart away where if you just in your mind realize you have to protect your civilization's life. And it's as if it's like the kind of inner rebellion. This inner rebellion is a sort of internal revolution. It's a sort of the mystical aspects. It's like the re- it's like the rebellious nature of the ego, in some sense, is too dynamic to stay limited. The search for knowledge is, in some sense, a revelation of the unknown. There is so much to the world. The mind oscillates between chaos and order. Uh, A kind of something playful that I'll share from my own personal experience. I had a moment in my life where literally uh, my mind visualized uh, in one moment. I just, my mind projected the most chaotic sense of myself in front of me and brought the most ordered sense. It's as if I saw the sense of self I would have if I if I was in, in, in a universe of order and I saw the sense of self I would have if I was in a universe of chaos. I want you to imagine you are the most powerful and richest person walking in a third world country and you see a starving child on the ground and its face is in the dirt. Imagine you see a starving child literally like defeated by the world's lack of care. And so you suddenly run to help that child. And as you help the child up, you see the child has your own face when you were a child. It's your child self. It's the inner child. You begin to kind of see the from the most ultimate position 
it's like there's a way you can be honored by life and of course you can be dishonored any moment you dishonor too much eventually outer chaos becomes inner chaos and inner chaos just makes you not care for outer chaos so outer chaos automatically wins this is why in a, in a fight but in back in the day the first person who got angry lost the fight What's fascinating is because we, every person has uh, different genetics and because our intelligences are very different, what that means is no two people have see the same world. So every living person you see, there is something different about them that makes them them and makes them you. So that difference automatically means you have nothing in common with everybody in, in, from, uh, existentially you know because you are projecting the relationships then you reach a point where you see it's as if like uh, in, in the appreciation of the silence life life moves you differently it's as if trust me these um you study your attention and it opens up and then your relationship with the linguistic simulation changes, so the language threshold, you navigate beyond it. As you pilot your attention beyond uh, uh, thoughts of dualistic meaning, let's say. To be honest, it's like people are either using their minds as swords or they're using as 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 shields. When you use your mind as a shield too much, you submit to fear. When you use your mind too much as a sword, you submit to desire. Therefore, life becomes a sort of balance. It's as if like the surfer uh, who met, under, understood that he had to adjust to the wave rather than having the wave adjust to them. You become a person who walks in this world as Marcus Aurelius, this great Caesar said. The soul is dyed with the color of its thoughts. That means it's like your moment is painted with how your attention opens up to it. The Yoga Patanjali Sutras, they say that your consciousness is like a glass orb. And what that means is literally this glass orb is moving around different colored surfaces and re-identifying. So pretty much if you pay attention to your personality, every place you go, you're, you're a different response as a person to that moment. So your personality cannot be the same. So eventually you'll realize soon that your mind is momentary generation of phenomena, but this phenomena at its core on an existential level, the experience has no story. 
That's the brilliance of life's design. Because once you see that design, you want to be responsible for it. You want something good that's happened so far to at least live a bit longer. Sometimes it's like uh, we, we have to forget what made uh, the scribes of mankind kind of useful. Human beings, they fulfill certain personal purposes. I think by the age of 25 and above, you pretty much, after the first 25 years of life, I think it's fair to say uh, you lived for yourself enough. <laughs> After you lived for yourself, what that means is like you're seeking personal joy as the ultimate fulfillment of life. And then you realize, no, 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 it's not personal joy. The greater sense of personal joy arrives from serving the collective. But what is the collective? We don't want it to be ideologically oriented because tyrants are born out of ideological possession. It's literally they believe somebody begins believing what they, it's like you, you're not a thought. You know, I respect language as as a technology, but you're not the you're not. It's like just because you, you, you uh, t Tony Stark enters the Iron Man suit, you can't say Tony Stark is the Iron Man suit. You know, this again goes to Rene Descartes' dualism of the mind and body. You know. There was something, there's this brilliant story of René Descartes, and I believe it was a sort of Victorian prince, uh, not Victor, Victorian, no, no, not Victorian. There was this princess, this princess at the time came up to René Descartes, this um, French philosopher, and she asked him, she challenged, she said something where it's as if René Descartes is in, is in his crib with his, like, you know, homies and stuff, you know, and uh, this princess comes in to battle him philosophically, and it's incredible how the story goes, and the princess is really smart, and she comes to Rene Descartes as a young girl, you know, this princess, and Rene Descartes is, is like, yes, my princess, uh, my, you know, my queen, to be respectful, she says, uh, what can I do? And she says, uh, she says, I have, I've come to ask you a question about this dualism of the mind and body. You, it's as if you're suggesting the mind is in its own universe and the body is in its own universe, right? But let me ask you a question. And it's like oh, everybody, all of Rene Descartes' homies are like, whoa, let's see what happens next, yo. You know? <laughs> and suddenly what happens is she says... What is the purpose of knowing that you have a mind if it has nothing to do with the body? She, she challenged, she opened up that level of questioning, why does the mind need the body then? You know, as if he, he dismantling the, alter, the kind of one, of one of Rene Descartes axioms. It was incredible. You know, it's like, just like how a sort of playful tension arises in human beings when the intensity of activity increases. Similarly, it's like uh, the minds of people open up philosophically as well. It's as if I say this, your body is made of earth, your mind is made of sky, and the sky is endless. So what I'm saying is that there's a part of our intelligence that is so free, it doesn't need to even conceive the idea of freedom, but it doesn't mean it doesn't need to look at data. So pretty much you, this is the pilot of, this is kind of like I said in my, in, in these talks I give, I kind of say that I, to be honest, everything you, I say, treat it, hear it playfully. Um, but to be honest, these two ideas are really serious ideas I entertain instead, man's communicators and the pilots of consciousness. These are terms I've kind of brought forth. And so the reason it's so important, kind of like one of these, like, major mystery within things that I'm saying, like,
The Hidden Commands of Collective Evolution. How else would I say that sentence? The direction of the wind that has no form. And eventually it comes down to one, pri one primary thing which decides if you enter the unknown uh, honestly or authentically or unauthentically. When you enter the unknown unauthentically, you're in a simulation. It's like you know you're fooling around, so it's like there's no clarity. But in, in some sense, when you authentically enter the unknown, there's a strange reference of a sort of non-definition, non-defining attitude. And it's like it doesn't matter what the unknown shows you. You're looking at the nature of what is, how truth relates to everything else. And what truth is, is fundamentally a starting point from the objective evolution into a position where we are now subjectively evolved. As creatures, literally people can write stories of their lives and share it. You know, it's like I find that's the greatest contribution. I personally say human beings, it's like this civilization. You know why I'm saying our civilization is not advanced? Because it is not acknowledging its greatest resource, the human mind. And imagine if the attention of all 8 billion people, instead of going on meaningless media, it just went on the most important ideas that require the civilization to evolve. Literally, we have to redesign uh, new paradigms, new ways, uh, new halls where uh, greater uh, conversations can occur. There has to be a sort of a rebellion for language. Aristotle says it is the sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea. Uh, to It's the sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. What that means is acknowledge what your mind provides for you and gives you access to But do not hold on to it. It's as if when I realized the cosmos shouted to me, I'm like, what's the point of life? And the cosmos shouted, you're too temporary to understand. I was like, okay, I'm too temporary, cosmos. You're telling me? I'm <laughs> and it was like, how can I tell you very playfully? It's like a moment where the inner rebellion occurs. The inner rebellion to access the honest intelligence. I don't think there is honestly stupid or smart. That concept is flawed. Those concepts are old. They're like the auto, uh, the first automotive, you know. So it's like one of those things where we have to acknowledge new ways of looking at the same things. And it's very simple. It's like just like how you could put a three-dimensional object. Like right now in front of me, there's a cup. I'm looking at this cup. Literally, I can move into a different degree to a different side of this cup and look at it. And I'm still looking at the same cup, but I'm looking at it from a different angle of how the universe is con considered. You know, to be honest, when you get really mystical with life, you're actually, you laugh because you realize what is that unknown thing you had behind your beliefs and your superstition was actually the lack of effort to see how your mind is generating your moment. And to, how your mind generates your moment has to do with you caring, reaching a point where you're ready to learn from yourself, 
from your mind more than the, the mind of others. Right now, these talks, this is why I say if the best thing that ex an external voice can be for you is a clear mirror. Language is a mirror of your own intelligence. Everything is. So we have to care to realign, re-sculpt our intelligence. Michelangelo, he has this quote where he says, like, this dude was a sculptor back in the day. And he said, I saw the angel in the stone and I set it free. As if his mind saw a design in that rock that he could, by ridiculous amount of effort, make it happen. Right? So it was as if from the unknown, a conscious vision. As if when, the, when you reach the edge of your knowledge, you, that's when you find the unknown. That's when the hidden commands of collective evolution literally no longer become hidden when you are looking through the eyes of the collective. The collective is a very unique idea. We are biologically united, but at the same time, conceptually able to be united. And even existentially, like positionally, we're united. It's like, I don't have a choice, guys. Uh, uh, because it's uh, we're all on a rock in the middle of nowhere. To be honest, the normal thing is everybody should be freaking out all the time. But we don't. <laughs> because we realize that we have to manage how that story of our life unfolds. And so when you respect the story of your life, you kind of let, let it align. And so pretty much it's really hilarious because it's one of those things where Lao Tzu, he said... Um, action through inaction. What he meant literally is like the person looking for the solution. This is what the ultimate wisdom is. <sighs> just stop. And just be in a moment. I find that um, when we realize the true position of language for the human species, it's like, here's a poetic passage, it's like it was then that the cosmos whispered in the ear of every prophet after you have climbed the mountain of language, once you are at the peak, once you have brought the chaos into the ultimate order, you will realize the next journey no longer requires your feet. The ultimate evolution is again a return to the non-existent. Because it has to be. It's just how story is projected until the uh, curtains are pulled. But these curtains are pulled with meaning. They're not pulled meaninglessly. And so, to be honest, it doesn't matter what idea you believe in. It, you just have to be intelligently active with the life of the world. What that means is just like how you're breathing in a moment and you're intelligent. Imagine the whole cosmos is alive. It's as if, imagine it's a lie, it's all emptiness. Imagine it's not empty. Maybe it's filled with various moments. It's as if just like the world is made of many atoms, you know? The subjective cosmos is made of many uh, bubbles of reality, you know? It's as if we don't realize it, but the minds of the human species is being an, a, a, a new dimension, you know? Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. One thing I want to, I want to say is that um, I recommend everybody who hears these talks uh, start writing. But this is your attitude to it, I think. It, this is how I think it will be efficient. 
get a bunch of paper, like printer paper, put it on a table you pass by often, somewhere where it's uh, uh, an environment you pass by, put a pen on top of it and don't touch that paper and have this kind of like principle where you won't pick up the pen unless there is something important to write, something that you have to capture, you have to bring forth from your subjective realm into your objective realm. What that means is you have to honor what you don't know to rediscover the way you originally were. It's as if we don't realize it. It's like when when we see, like I remember, I uh, how can I tell you? I have I have walked in third world countries and I've walked in first world countries. I have literally walked in palaces, and I have in some sense also walked in uh, uh, the dirtiest streets. And I could tell you, it's one of those things where. Life is just various, how can I tell you, it's, um, we paint it into value. And so that's where the creative freedom suddenly uh, arises from the honest intelligence. So then it's like you're, how can I tell you, you're not, you're not resisting the world for not allowing your inner nature to be as it was. <sighs> Some yogi, um, I think it was Papaji or something, somebody asked him, it's like, why do people have egos? And Papaji was like, whoa. And Papaji told him, because they are rejected by the divine will. And this dude's like, whoa. <laughs> They're rejected by the divine will. Fascinating concept. As if we weren't alone from the beginning. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Much blessings and awesome.